Hey, everybody. It's a privilege to be here. I remember, as Coanne said, you know, uh, uh, Michael Braugart and I wrote Cradle to Cradle in 2002, and we were, we've were we been supporting sustainable brands. And um, today I'm going to talk about future textiles. This is a particularly interesting to me because the first product I ever worked on after, you know, being an architect for many years was textiles. And I was asked by Steelcase Corporation to design textiles for furniture. And it's the, the first time we went in and looked at the deep chemistries and started work on textiles, 1994. So this is a very exciting thing for me to just, to be able to talk to you about. So the, the issue of textiles is so critical because we're dealing with such incredible volumes and a very basic human industry that essentially is the core of manufacturing because manufacturing comes from the words uh, that represent hand and execution, hand execution, Man, as you know, in French is hand. And, and so the idea of hand execution is something that goes all the way back to the beginning of human enterprise beyond hunter gathering. And as we settle down, we use bricks, we use fibers, we make tents, we make clothing. Because textiles are such a critical part of people's entry into the economy, and it represents the most ancient of human manufacturing technique, uh, weaving, rugs, weaving and knotting, handwork. So if we look at the inputs involved in the textile industry, from either what's coming in and then what's coming out and where it's going, we see trillions of dollars, euros being distributed and, and we can wonder what happens next to these materials. It's a really critical one. And as we see ourselves moving toward fast fashion, uh, I think some of the recent numbers here in the U.S. is the average person's having something like 50 to 60 um, new garments a year. Uh, we're realizing this is incredibly accelerated and shortened use cycles for apparel. And so we end up with more and more things that are waste. And I've just been informed recently that there are places now that are not accepting used clothing that used to treat them as a terrific asset because they, they're overloaded or they, they don't need them and the value is too low. So we have to be really serious about this area. And that's why I think it's a good thing for us all to discuss. Even with cotton, and organic, we realized that it might involve an incredible amount of water and, and there are effects of that water use, both in terms of water itself, but also energy. Every time we use water, we have to move it, heat it, um, things like that. They're integrally connected. We can also see that some synthetic man-made fibers, while not as water intensive, you know, have issues with pollution and sustainability as well. So across all textiles and dyeing, we have to be very sensitive to the fact there's a great number of chemicals that are engaged in this. And, you know, as a designer, it's really important uh, that we talk to people who have understandings of these issues down to the fundamental questions of what are these chemistries and their effects. When we look at these chem chemicals and we realize that we're shipping this stuff all over the world and we realize where projects, where products are being bought by customers and consumers and where are they being put um, and, and sent, we realized that, that this is a story of, of various flows around the planet and that we, we can start to think about how to turn this into an optimized system rather than simply bemoaning its existence. This is an important part of modern life. And while we can consider all these to be uh, of issues of concern, we can also realize these are opportunities for us to be involved in constant improvement. So when we look at some of the materials that are showing up, you know, they, they get cataloged now. And as we get more and more ability to test and get transparency on various things, we can see more and more of these um, materials and their relationships and their effects as, as the world communicates. And so we can also see that there's concern on every level, including government levels, regulatory levels, things like that, which are of concern. And that 
China, for example, has a five-year plan on circular economy, and and they're looking at this as essentially a you know hope for elimination of of deleterious materials. There are plenty of people now concerned about these issues, and the issue of circular economy has become a clearly important one, as it always has been in cradle cradle thinking, because it's really material realization, the second part of cradle cradle's five parts. First is safe and healthy materials. So just as we look at the whole issue of circular economy, we do need to realize that just circulating something isn't necessarily the increase in qualification. It's a quantification. So if we circulate something that isn't uh, healthy, then we're going to circulate something dangerous over and over. Just because it's circular doesn't mean it's good. So first is quality, and second is quantity. So when we look at something like a recycled polyesters, we can see in this diagram that there is various elements, inputs, um, chips being melted, purification, other chemical processes, then molten polyester fiber, and then in this case, a, a garment. And so we can start to look at what it means to purify and, and take back re these recycled materials and actually purify them, what we would call upcycling. And bring them in and then improve their quality. And then at the end, we ask ourselves, is it the end or is there a next use? So the first thing would be to eliminate antimony. And then the second would be to realize that if we're adding metal zippers or other things, we're taking and making a product that cannot be recycled. So that we should and could be able to do a design for next use and continue the process of circularity. So if we look at many of the projects out there in this area that have had an effect on efficiency, saving in various things, we see water and energy are obviously connected, and we can see the idea that we would reduce toxins and increase uh, safe materials as our strategy, which is essentially the upcycle. So we could look at, on the left, our inventory, uh, look at that spine in the middle, which would be our assessment of what we want, what we don't want, and then we reduce what we don't want, we increase what we do want, and the world gets better because we're improving. In circular economy terms, it moves us from a linear economy of take, make, and waste and to a one where we eliminate the concept of waste. And we don't even make garments that then can't be recycled. We actually think through use, next use, retake, remake, retake, remake, and then restore. So if we look at typical buyer's specification, and most people, it's really, can I afford it, does it work, and do I like it? It might be in the reverse order, it depends, but it's those three. Can I afford it, does it work, do I like it? So to that we're adding, what if it was also, if it was cradle cradle certified, which has these five conditions of material, ecological health, circular economy, let's circulate healthy things, clean energy, what we're now working on, we call carbon positive, and then clean water, and social benefit and sharing. Those are the conditions. The first condition would be, which cycle are we in? Are we in biological cycle or technical cycle? So this would be design things that go back to nature, or fundamental to human health, or things that are going back to the technosphere, the polyesters and so on. And could they still be safe for human health as we use them and so on? So the first would be biological nutrient. So that would be materials that are going back to nature or can, maybe come from the soil, too. A technical material would be one designed to have an next use in technical cycles, like polymers. So types of textiles would be animal-based, like silk or wool, plant-based, such as linen and cotton, and synthetic materials, um, such as polypropylene, polyester, rayon, nylon, and so on. So these materials are, are historically um, coming from the natural world, and now from the technical world as well. So we can start to then put them into protocols which understand that we're about to do things to these materials. And we can also start to specify those things that are gonna be done to the materials, because it's not enough to just say, oh, it's natural. We typically have treated it with various things and, and dyes and very finishes and, and so on. So let's, we have to look at a whole system and then wonder what happens to it 
next as well, and what happened to the environment around it and to the people wearing it. So in this, we have a rating system to look at the various chemicals, um, and we consider we have hazardous materials to, to materials that aren't considered hazardous. And then we look at designing with the clients the various textiles. This is one that we did for Victor and Novatex in Canada, and it was a titanium catalyzed polyester instead of antimony. And it was an interesting story because the catalysts were made by Axon Nobel, and they they were a white powder that came from Medellin, which was a bit odd, as you can imagine, during the shipping process. So, um, but these are catalyzed with with materials that we consider more propitious, of course, than heavy metal. And so, when we look at the making of these textiles and, and the fabrics involved in the clothing, we realize that some we could, would consider hybrids, and in, that people are putting together different blends. In the case, you know, for a T-shirt, might, for example, be cotton and polyester, and so you're mixing a biological material with a technical material, and that becomes problematic looking at its next use. So there are pl people that are worrying about those things and, and dealing with the question of how do we separate these materials later for recovery. We also have to worry about some of the materials that have been put in uh, during the process that are problematic and need to be really thought through. So an example of a technical biological hybrid would be polyester cotton blend, as we, met, as we mentioned, for example. And then uh, here's a, a project that uh, is clothing for work that was assessed by uh, a PIA and done in development with them uh, is a cotton uh, certified gold materials that are used in work clothing. So, uh, you know, the kind of project that it would be worth considering because it's it's a defined system. And and then here's another kind of hybrid material, which would be technical and technical materials, two different kinds of polymer that may not be uh, compatible with the recycling protocols that are easy. Um, so then it becomes a question of what do we see? And as an architect and designer, my first job is to see and wonder how we see. And and as a lot of people will come to me and say, well, you know, my back garden looks terrible. You know, do you have any recommendations for landscape designers? And I, I, I will often think to myself, well, to you, it might look like it's getting terrible, but to a butterfly, it's getting better every day. So how you see and what you see is really important. So for most people, when they see fashion, which is ephemeral, comes and goes, you start to see your basic thing, a silk gown, a cap, gloves, shoes, pants, whatever. But if you're looking through lenses of the people who are considering the sort of deep issues around around the cradle cradle agenda from a design perspective, from a chemical perspective, from a production perspective, you start to see different things. And it's good for us to see. And it's good for us to be able to see deeply and to interconnect some of the issues. Like if I put on metal zippers, you know, onto a polyester, you know, have I made that piece of clothing impossible to recycle in practical ways? So the first product we did was working in uh, organic materials. This is wool and Ramey. And we did it with Steelcase Corporation. And, uh, and the idea was to design something for furniture that was so, um, so carefully considered that we didn't have disposal of hazardous waste. So the trimmings were no longer considered hazardous waste and that there was value through the, through the entire chain. And we reduced the number of chemicals to optimized chemicals, working with EPIA and the chemists, and then later you know, developing the product with uh, Rohner Mill in Switzerland that looked at the whole system as an optimized system and ended up with fabric that was essentially clean enough to eat if you had a fiber deficiency. But that the trimmings, instead of being hazardous waste, became mulch for the local garden club. This was very important because the water coming out of the textile mill turned out to be as clean as the water going in, and this is Swiss drinking water. And the trimmings became mulch for the local garden club. So if you really think about this, it's a new kind of design where regulations are seen as a signal 
of design failure because the the products end up not being even regulated because there's nothing to fear. This is an immensely important idea that we can design without regulation, not because we're trying to avoid society's concerns, but because we're not giving society concerns to worry about. That's a fundamental idea. When we look at the other kinds of textiles, uh, for example, um, polymers, this is the carpets that we did to get away from soft PVC typically used in that industry and still used by major actors who are considering what they do circular because they recirculate it, but they're recirculating PVC, which we're trying not to do in terms of soft PVCs and so on. Um, this was designed with thermoplastic polyolefins and nylon 6 for Berkshire Hathaway and Shaw many years ago. And it's a, by the way, this is uh, the new butterfly collection I've done with them. And we did one um, many years ago called the Walk in the Garden, and that's being reintroduced. So it's exciting for us because essentially, if you look out at an industry like this, we realize there's 1.4 pounds of car billion pounds of carpet waste in the United States. And what happens if we burn it? Well, that could be a problem, certainly with PVC, but what a waste. And then it's more carbon in the atmosphere and so on. What if they were designed to come back and we stored our, our materials on our customers' floors and we stay in relationship with them? And that's really what happened here. And, and this is now a company that is, um, majority of products are credit credit certified and the benefits are being brought to them including moving from number five in the market space to number one in the process, which is a pretty valuable signal. Um, and so these kinds of things are really worth considering. So as we look at the circular economy, I think what's really important to understand about the kind of thing that we were, that Michael and I are communicating in the world is that there's a way of thinking about these things as products of consumption, which is biological materials, you actually consume them, and products of service, which are technical materials that we want, where we want the use, um, the carpet, the television, your house, um, a car. And that those products of service, as we've discussed, can be essentially used across generations and reused if they're thought about that way. Now, it's interesting to note that we now see this coming not just in workwear, but also in jeans. And so there's a company in the Netherlands that's now leasing the jeans. And, and then they have a chain of custody for their materials that is, is quite robust and very carefully put into a constant improvement program. Um, and it's because we can look at these clothes and we can start to see them differently. We think this way. And if we imagine we're getting them back, then we can actually design it knowing that we're coming back with these resources. We're taking our, our sources, our resources, and we can think about it uh, vigorously start to optimize. So the question is, what can you do now? Well, first, have a look at the Cradle Cradle Certified Program at c2cCertified.org, which is where we put the certification. It's a third-party, independent, peer-reviewed organization, and it does assessment, I mean certifications. And you can identify an assessor, and MBDC is one of them. They're now 13. And you can, because we wanted to expand the number of people who can do this around the world, so we have. And so that's it. So they're, they're available, and they all work from the same standard, that is this independent standard. And, and then we can optimize by looking at your product and trying to do a few steps, reduce the number of material types. We've just seen you know, a new polyester clothing with 3D polyester buttons. So the whole thing is polyester. How exciting. And then we've, we look at increased use of recycled materials. But be careful that you remember to upcycle them as needed. And then um, we can extend the use cycles of products. Some people today are saying, I'm designing 30-year clothing. I have the great pleasure, I must say, of, of having uh, my grandfather, who was a lumberjack in the Pacific Northwest, had Filson clothing. And it's what the lumberjacks and gold miners used to wear, heavy wool made by Pendleton, actually, and uh, which has certified wool. And um, I still wear my grandfather's jacket when I'm gardening. And there's something about that being wrapped in your, in your family across generations that's a real pleasure. But th that would be a product that's really an heirloom. But when you compare that to fast fashion, which might last weeks, you're dealing with things that are either ephemeral, so they're short cycle, 
or medium cycle, like you might have this for you know, a dozen years or a couple dozen years, like a car or a washing machine. And then you have long cycle, which are infrastructure and heritage products that last for centuries. So the, you might want to look at what you want to not have and identify things like that and start to identify what you do want. And the great thing about the cradle to cradle expanding now so vigorously is that you can actually get cradle to cradle certified ingredients. And these are, are listed at the Institute over time, you'll see the ingredients get accumulated. So you have places to go to find things that have been assessed uh, for your use, and you can do something with it. And that ties into the work the Institute is doing on what they call Fashion Positive, which is this program that specifically relates to the use of cradle-to-cradle uh, -cradle certified protocols to improve the fashion industry. And it's a gathering of the tribe, so to speak, who can compare, learn, um, build a community, foster collaboration, identify the building blocks of a cradle cradle certified industry. And the cradle cradle, just remember, is healthy materials uh, and for human ecological systems. It's circular economy, circulate healthy things in a proper fashion, biological technical cycles for next use, products as services, products that go back to soil, and then clean energy, water, and, and social benefit, and sharing. So Fashion Positive can do this in the fashion industry, and it's very exciting. So they've created a collaboration system, uh, sharing of materials that are certified for, for your use, for people, and we're very excited to see that they've done this uh, for everyone, and focused in on the fashion industry in this case. It's very exciting. So you can get access to different kinds of things that make this work um, and compare notes with your collaborators. So I think as I close this up, it's really about fashioning endlessly. And fast fashion shouldn't be seen as an evil thing. It should be seen as what we do now. And fashioning is to be remembered that fashion is a verb. And sometimes we deal with currency, sometimes we deal with capital. When we deal with currency, we're dealing with ephemera and exchange. When we deal with capital, we're dealing with orchards and long-term strategy. So we're going to have both. And I think that if we could turn things into biological and technical nutrients powered by the sun with clean water and shared benefits in a legitimate way, we could imagine that when we got a new shirt, instead of saying, oh, whoa, whoa, us, the world just got worse because I got a new shirt, it might be, oh, isn't this amazing? The world just got a little better because I got a new shirt and I'm supporting something. And that endlessly is important because cradle to cradle is about endlessly. We don't design for end of life. We design to perpetuate life and to allow it to grow. So what do we do next? You look at your work as executives, what's the right thing to do, and as managers, what's the right way to do it, and you act in terms of consumers and, and customers, you start asking for these things and you encourage them, you communicate your preferences and you put them in your first purchasing specifications and you drive it toward this kind of thing and you support everyone through the streams, value streams, so the world gets better because you're here. Okay, thanks so much, Bill. Um I'm going to pop back on the video and we can have a quick discussion. There have been several questions that have come up that I think make nice um, general follow ons to some of your comments. Actually, the first one that was um, brought up at the very beginning of the conversation was, was um, uh, maybe an, an illustration of your discussion about biological versus technical nutrients. Uh, the question was whether, <laughs> how, do, how do you deal with stain and water repellent? Um, in the in the cradle to cradle system, and uh, I'm curious when you talk about purifying um, textiles, does that make the uh, material a, a biological material that is just getting purified, or is it necessarily a technical material? Or talk a little bit more about all the additives to the fabrics that um, are such an issue. Let me ask Jay since he's got the science of this. Let me ask Jay yeah. to join us for a minute and Great. respond. Great to this um, directly, and because it's part of a, a transitional area where we're really 
excited about who can address these issues and start to do the constant improvement that's inherent in that upcycle. But Jay, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's unfortunate that the, the state of, of chemistry today, in particular uh, green chemistry, requires the use of fluorinated compounds to give us the soil and, and stain resistance that um, you know, folks desire on, on textiles. So this is clearly a work in progress. And these are things that potentially sh should or could be uh, biological nutrients, but they're not designed to be right now. So there's plenty of room for uh, optimization in the, uh, in the soil and stain uh, category, for sure. And things. I think that's part of what the idea of the certification program is, is to, is to identify these places for these kinds of improvement and inspire the chemical industry to design this way so that they can um, service this area. And we've seen so many examples of that. It's been very inspiring to us to watch the companies as they rise to their occasions. I would second that. We're seeing a lot of innovation in this field. One of our corporate members, Nova Zymes, is a great example of a company that's using natural enzymes to try and tackle some of these, um, some of these uh, challenges that have typically been um, solved through petrochemical-based solutions. So that's great. Um, was there any other question, any sort of deeper question related to that topic that anybody wanted to pose? Pop it up. Um, one of the other questions that I've seen pop up is um, this question of, uh, the question was how do, how can C2C address issues related to microplastics and wastewater in the oceans? And I think that comes back to take back um, issues, right? I wonder if you can speak a little bit to what you're seeing um, in that uh, you know, on, on that front with some of your clients? Are you addressing not only the design side, but also the whole systems design? Oh, definitely. Not only product design, but the whole, you know, the whole end, end of life issue. Yeah, well, we don't use end of life, so we say Sorry. <laughs> end of use. Yeah. Yes. Right. And I think that's the problem, because you see so many people looking at end of life, and it looks like we might cause it. Um, so uh, if we look at the fact that the plastics in the ocean, the latest data points I'm seeing, are that we expect that potentially by 2050, uh, the weight of plastics in the ocean will be equal to or exceed that of fish. Oh my goodness. Isn't that horrifying? It's, it's astonishing. And so obviously we have to look into this, but it, this is the trend, you know? And so, this isn't really crazy. So I think the first thing in design is change the way we see and to get these products designed for recycling. Because if they're not designed to go back into cycles, we can't cost effectively re-engage with them. And that's part of the question. The next issue then would be the circular economy issue after we do healthy and, uh, safe and healthy and be able to be in a defined system cost effectively would be the defined system uh, of the economic system, which is circular economy, the second condition of cradle to cradle material utilization. So then we have to design those systems. And the key, it seems to me, is uh, in one sense uh, concentration and flow. You can't manage something unless you can concentrate it and flow it. It's like we have to do that with money. We have to do that with um, anything we're trying to, you know, with liquids. Uh, so you have to be able to get it together. So if we have this diaspora, this entropy of plastics and clothing, for example, it's entropic. It, it's a crazy thing, but it's the law of physics. You know, it's like entropy, everything going to chaos, never to return. But when you look at biology, it's essentially negative entropy. It's, it's dispersed forms of energy, sunlight, connecting with dispersed forms of mineral and, and, uh, and the gases of the atmosphere, and it's carbon and minerals and water and solar energy combining into the plant that you burn for entropy. So it's, biology is negative entropy. So if we think about the system where waste equals food, as we like to say, in biological systems, and we apply that to technical systems, and then we don't have them cross-contaminating, and then we can concentrate them and flow them. So biological materials can go back to cellulosics, they can go back to soil, and technical materials back to technical cycles. 
which then brings us to the question in terms of plastics in the ocean. I wouldn't consider them to be mostly clothing, um, but this idea of the microplastics becomes a question of, uh, and the scientists who are working on these things obviously will be more erudite than me on this, or than I, than I will be. But uh, essentially, we're looking at the difference, for example, between biodegradability and compostability. So there are many things that can break down, even as plastics, into tiny bits um, of plastic. But when you look at compostable things in soil, they're breaking down to bits chemicals, chemicals of life itself, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and so on. So I think that that's a design thing, you see, because you're designing the biological materials to go back to being soil means they break down into, into compostable. When you're looking at technical materials, it's even if we break it into tiny bits and it's still a technical material, we haven't gone back to soil. We've just, we've just happened to break it into tiny bits, which makes it very hard to concentrate and flow because it's in tiny bits distributed, you see? So, so I think this is a whole system issue, and you can take various approaches to it. Some people would say all plastics should be bio-based and biodegradable, but we might say, well, let's think bio, but even technically based, because we can break things down. But when we break them down, don't say necessarily biodegradable, we might want to say compostable. So there's subtlety to this, but it is a whole system. And, and we do have to honor the fact that we are going to be using technical materials. And we're going to be using oil for quite a while for these matters. And unfortunately, most of it is burned. And, and so it's it's dispersed in entropic ways into the atmosphere and into the oceans as a result of being in the atmosphere. But, but in terms of the plastics and these various other materials, they too are suffering from a kind of entropy. And I think we can look at oil as soil without the S after time, temperature, and pressure. And there is no reason we can't, if we have oil, we can't use it to restore soil health too. That's also quite interesting to me. So we have to remember what Sheikh Yamani said forming OPEC when they asked him, would we ever see the end of the age of oil? And today we're seeing the Saudi Arabia discussing selling its oil futures to do new technologies. That's interesting because it's such a commodity, fossil fuels at this point. And he, his answer was, I don't know that we'll ever see the end of the age of oil but I do know that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. So um, we don't have to wait to run out of oil to tackle this question. And we might want to use the oil for positive purposes, intelligent dealt with those chemicals, rather than burning it, for example, or dispersing things. So oh, negative they, they, entropy. They, they, yeah. Negative entropy. I was I was so inspired by Jimmy Xerox who presented um, in Thailand last week. Who was talking about managing to um, maintain a 99.5 percent re fully recyclable recyclability rate, I guess, of their multifunction printers, where they're taking the whole thing apart and actually really totally reusing all the uh, compound ingredients, which is a great example, I think. There was an interesting question here that I certainly would ask if I knew. <laughs> um, hopefully, Jay or you can an answer, which is um, Carla from Sao Paulo, Brazil, was, uh, is saying that she was surprised to find that there was a material in your fashion positive collection um, that is a yarn made of mixed cotton and recycled PET. Bionic DPX cotton recycled PET blend is the specific of it. And uh, she was asking, and, and I'm curious, is this not mixing a technical and biological nutrient? What a great question. Yeah. I get to hand that to Jay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, That's a great question. No, no. No, it is a, it is a great question. And, and you're right. Generally, you know, the principles say don't mix the technical and biological unless you have a strategy for how you can either separate them or reuse them as a hybrid material at the same or higher level of quality going forward. And so Bionic is working on, um, on both of those. 
So they've got um, some techniques and technologies that allow them to separate the biological and technical and put them into their respective metabolisms. Um, but they also have a way to reuse the yarn as yarn um, going forward. So, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. Again, transitional strategies is what we're looking for, and it's at the lab scale, not quite commercially uh, viable yet, but, but I think they'll be there um, soon. I think this issue of chain of custody that comes into this example, yeah. Cohen, is such a great question because I think we're dealing with context here, and you have to be really aware of the opportunities that are inherent in these various circular economies that are, that are part of all this. So if you looked at those mud jeans, for example, there's a case where Bert and Son, who's the entrepreneur there, has a defined chain of custody, right? So oh. you can actually get the stuff back and do what, you've got it, what you're going to do with it. So by holding on to it, you've concentrated it and flowed it in a contained system. That's very interesting. So just and for those of you who don't know about Mudgeen, this is a, um, a new business that's based on a, a leasing model. So you, you lease your genes rather than, or you subscribe to access to your genes rather than purchasing them, um, which we, we love and think it's a great, great model. It's obviously, you know, a very incipient thing and a very, you know, serious thing to try to do. And so we, you know, I'm very excited about it because I, I'm happy to support Bert in this because it's such a brave and wonderful thing he's moving into, um, which is this chain of custody and concentration of flow. So it's like there are so many things that when these things were first brought up as things to consider, people found them very awkward. They, they couldn't imagine leasing a washing machine. But as an architect, you know, I, work, I build big buildings every day that are leased for 15 years. The people don't own the building, they use the building. And what's the difference between a washing machine and a building? I don't know, about 50 meters in <laughs> dimension. You know, that's about it. So it's a bunch of metal, glass, rubber. <laughs> um, so the idea that we'd actually use these materials across time as services is really quite something. So the other thing we're starting to see in the separations of polyesters and, and the organics is um, lots of challenges that are being put out there in order to do this in bulk. We've seen um, competitions around it. We're seeing a lot of work in enzymes that are being used to separate these materials. Uh, there's mechanical separations. There's, you know, it's, it's a very important thing to deal with. And so the idea that there's somebody trying to solve it by design up front and, they're, and it's forcing them to take on the logistics issues as well as the material issues is where we're going to learn. Thank you. So uh, there's another question that's come up, and I'm sure you guys uh, deal with this or address it often, which is how does certification impact the cost of the end user product? Um, and are you seeing any indicators at all that customers are willing to pay more for the certification in any sector? Well, I'll, I'll just say that generally, as I watch the work we've been able to do, here, one of the marvelous parts of it is that it often saves money for the people who engage it. It does two things. It stimulates innovation, because you have to think differently, and that's exciting for people. And, and then it often saves money, and, and, and it's sometimes counterintuitive. And one of the reasons is obviously efficiency. If you're out there to you know, be renewably powered and have clean water as a human right, well, you stop wasting energy and water, and that's efficiency, and that can save you a lot of money, and that one gets logged in pretty fast. Then we also see people learning how to use renewable power that's cost-effective, and for them, that becomes sort of surprising and delightful, where they start you know, making money on being renewable. I mean, there's a reason Walmart made a statement that you'd be 100% renewably powered that was very powerful, because they're now the largest corporate owner of solar collectors in the United States, and they're doing it because it's cost effective. So that helps drive an industry and get up the infrastructure and the types of contracts that are necessary for those things to occur. So, so that is saving the money or they wouldn't be doing it. That's interesting. Um, we also see that you remove yourself from the world of regulatory uh, pressure on certain fronts, which saves you money because filling in paperwork is not necessarily that productive financially for you. And then 
as you produce effluents or various things, like we did in Switzerland, where the materials are no longer a cost because the trimmings in Switzerland were no longer legal to bury a bird in Switzerland. They had to ship it to Spain. So what is the point of a company shipping its trimmings as hazardous waste to another country and paying for all that when redesign the product and you get it to the local garden club and save money? So, you know, you think about it, it's a twofer. You get health and economic benefit. So this kind of thing is really regular. When we did the carpet with Shaw, it turned out that we could lightweight the carpet because of the optimized materials that are designed for the purposes, the nylons and the polyolefins, and and so on. And all of a sudden, you know, it's 10% cheaper, and we're competing in a market, and we're starting to make money, even though we had to retool. So, wow, and now it's number one. So, yes, this is good. And we're looking, that's, we're looking, that's why people do this. Yeah, I mean, I think we see that across m many different situations, too, just really re-looking the way that we measure cost 